Nick was born in 1897 in Gauting, Germany, in southern Bavaria. He grew up reading the Old West adventure novels popular in Germany at that time. He was inspired by the continental tour of Wild West shows, as well as Western movies and Remington and Russell paintings reproduced in pulp magazines. Nick and his friends spent many happy hours playing cowboys and Indians. At the age of 16, Nick immigrated to New Jersey under the sponsorship of his uncle Peter. His dream to go west and see the places he'd read about was growing, and so was the strong desire to draw and paint. In 1916, Nick began four years of night classes studying art at Cooper Union in New York City and working as a lithographer in the American Lithographic Printing Company during the day. In the last semester at Cooper Union, he met Louise, who would eventually become his wife. Nick made his first art sale in 1920, three Western paintings to the firm of Street and Smith, publishers of the highly popular Western Story magazine. He joined the staff producing black and white drawings from the magazine. In May of 1924, Nick and Louise were married, and the next year they set out in their Model T for their first trip west, visiting Santa Fe, Taos, and Grand Canyon. Nick was not disappointed with the country he had dreamed of all his life. He felt it gave his work a new perspective, a new dimension, a new point of view. Returning east, and working in his West Middleford, New Jersey studio, Nick produced a great number of illustrations and easel paintings that brought the West alive to a growing audience. As time passed, Nick enjoyed an upswing both professionally and financially. He began collecting Western artifacts, pouring over books in libraries and visiting museums, carefully researching his subjects to ensure accuracy of his depictions. Dr. Evelyn often accompanied him on his research excursion. The pulp fiction industry waned after the Second World War, and Nick sought projects with other types of national magazines, such as True and Argosy. This was a period of transition. In the 1950s, he began to do more easel paintings, Nick and Louise had spent their entire married life in the East. With their daughter grown, they were ready for a new adventure. In 1961, they made the move to Cody, Wyoming, where Nick continued to paint for galleries and collectors. He still created illustrations for magazines and books. In 1973, the National Cowboy Hall of Fame honored Nick with their Trustees Award for Outstanding Contributions to Western Art. A chance reading of an article about model building and building models as a youth got Nick Egenhofer started on a new form of art. After making a plan of what model to build, Nick sought out the real thing. Museums gladly gave permission to take notes and measurements. Next, a working drawing was made to scale. One to eight was a good ratio to use and was easy to figure from the notes. This way, all the details were correct. Wagons and coaches, besides the wheels, are in two parts. The running gear, or undercarriage, wagon bed, or coach body. The two parts had to be fitted together, thus making exact measurements necessary. Besides making something from which to draw, building models was a very relaxing pastime. There was also a practical purpose. For example, if an illustration required an overturned wagon, Having an accurate replica to maneuver made it easier to produce the right perspective. The knowledge and information Nick gained from making transportation models was of immense value. Not many illustrators would go thus far to research their work. Over a period of years, Nick built 10 models, including buckboards, various wagons, ox carts, and stagecoaches. The Hot Springs County Museum is pleased to have the light Eastern Concord coach model in our collection. The dry brush technique. Much has been said of Nick Egenhofer's black and white dry brush style, 
which was ideally suited for reproduction on the poor grade of paper associated with the pulp magazines. His style was the result of much trial and error. It had an advantage over pen and ink because it could be done faster. Pen and ink dries slowly in a hard, wet line, and when not completely dry, could cause a smear, which is hard to correct. Dry brush, too, was done with wet ink, but had the advantage of quick drying, which allowed for working over without smearing. However, this was not as easy as it sounds. Dragging the brush across the paper to give the shading and tone required a very delicate touch and a lot of practice. Nick's technique yielded excellent results as is seen by his black and white illustrations. What is gouache? Sometimes referred to as opaque watercolor, gouache starts out similarly to watercolor. They are both composed of color pigment with a binding agent such as gum arabic. The pigment ratio in gouache is usually much greater than in watercolor. A solid white pigment such as chalk is often incorporated. This makes gouache heavier and more opaque with greater reflective qualities. Like watercolor, gouache is commonly diluted with water before being applied to paper. Unlike watercolor, it is opaque in its natural state and only becomes translucent when a larger amount of water is used to dilute the paint. Gouache dries to a different value than it appears when wet. Lighter tones generally dry darker and darker tones tend to dry lighter, which can make it difficult to match colors over multiple painting sessions. Its quick coverage and total hiding power mean that gouache lends itself to more direct painting techniques than watercolor. Commercial artists consistently use gouache for works in illustrations, comics, and other design work. Nick Egenhofer used gouache in many of his magazine and book color cover illustrations and eventually in his paintings. Wagon Freighter Bells. The use of bells on draft animals seems to be as old as transportation itself and freighting outfitters were no exception. Brass bells were favored, three to five in a setting on an iron hoop attached to the hams. There were often more than one set of bells on a team. The combined tones of different sized bells produced a pleasing sound, which gave a sense that all was well and going smoothly. This inspired the light-hearted expression, I'll be there with bells on. Freight wagons returning empty were obliged to pull off to the side of the road when hearing the bells of a loaded wagon to let them pass. Wagon roads, being what they were in the early days, breakdowns were common. It was customary for a freighter in distress to give a set of bells to another who helped him. This was a voluntary gesture involving just one set of bells in appreciation for services rendered. Nick Egenhofer strived for accuracy in his illustrations and paintings. These wagon freighter bells are just one of the many items he collected for study and research. 